Hello, hello, it's Lance. Vivek Tawari is a Broadway producer who has been involved with numerous shows, including Green Day's American Idiot. Mel Brooks is the producers in the forthcoming Jagged Little Pill musical. He's also a serious Beatles fan who has become an expert on the group's manager, Brian Epstein. Note his graphic novel on the subject, The Fifth Beatle. Vivek and I recently spoke about Brian for my video on the pronunciation of Epstein's last name. You can find a link to that in the description below. But our conversation went deeper than the clips that I used for that video, so I wanted to share our entire conversation here, lightly edited for clarity. It's just a chat, not a produced video, but I thought subscribers to this channel would appreciate learning a little bit more about Epstein and Vivek Tiwari in the process. All right, enjoy. Hey there. Good afternoon. Hey. What's going on, man? How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Is this uh? Can you see me okay? Does this all look okay? Man, we are set. This is good all stuff. Right. This is good stuff. Hey, uh, while I'm making sure that my recorder's going and checking levels and all that, let's see. Um, tell me about your favorite Beatles cover song. Favorite Beatles cover song? Um, that's a tough one. I mean, there's a, <laughs> there's a lot of good ones out there. Um, you know, it's fun. There, one that I, I like, well, there's a lot that I like a lot, but uh, there's the, I like the candy flip version of Strawberry Fields Forever. I don't know if you've ever heard that one. I have not, but that is my my favorite Beatles song because the story behind it is absolutely yeah. amazing. I haven't heard that cover though. Yeah, if you uh, are you on Spotify? Yeah. So I created a playlist called the Great Beatles Cover Up, which has a, a bunch of cover songs that I like a lot, um, and it, it's uh, it's on there. It might be a, you, I think you'd probably get a kick out of the the playlist. So yeah, man, that's great. I love that stuff. Yeah. Very cool. All right. Before we like officially get started, I know this is going to be ironic because we're talking about Brian. Let's pronounce your name the right way. Is it Vivek? Ah, not ironic at all. It is, it is Vivek. Okay. It is Vivek. And in fact, we'll probably, you know, we'll probably talk about that too. It's a, it's a, it, it's a good, my, my name is a good example of the Brian Epstein story. Yeah. Very when, cool. When it comes to his name in, in the sense that I mean, I'm sure we'll talk about this, but in the sense that like everybody says Epstein, right. uh, but it's just not correct. You know, then the fact that everybody says it doesn't make it correct, you know? Exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Same thing with, with my name. If you were to go look at videos or all old talk to my old friends or other people, you'll hear a lot of people saying Vivek. And you know what? I don't really care. It's not that big a deal to me, <laughs> yeah. but it's not correct. You know what I mean? Sure. So, sure. so it's the same sort of thing. Yeah. I got you. I got you. Hey, well, yeah. this is a really informal chat. Uh, it's, it's you know, it, it is what it is. It's not that big of a deal. You know, this isn't going on, you know, Fox News, CNN. Yeah. Or, I mean, this is, it's just whatever, right? Um, so, I'd rather talk to you than Fox News, though, for the record. <laughs> <laughs> or, or MSNBC or, you know, whoever, whoever. Uh, <laughs> point being, though, and by the way, am I am I too loud? Does it uh, sound all right? You're okay on my end, okay. yeah. All right, I was seeing some uh, levels here. Um, you know, my Beatles channel, like it's taken off like a rocket. It's really cool. These little stories that I make, I had no idea that people would enjoy them as much as they have. And awesome. you know, some are, uh, you know, broad. Like the biggest one that I've got is the story behind Hey Bulldog, which has done, yeah. gosh, eight hundred thousand views or something like that, which is Amazing. super Congrats. cool. It's super cool that people are enjoying it that much. Uh, but I, I like telling these fun little stories that people haven't heard before, haven't you know heard a million times before, especially for you know the diehard fans. There's so yeah. much out there already. There's so much to listen to, so many books to read. It's all good stuff. But um, uh, the YouTube flat platform, those stories haven't all been told. You know, so yeah. sometimes we can dig into this like little sliver of a story that might be 60 seconds or three minutes long, and it's fun to just tell it kind of visually. So I, I know yeah. you get that a little bit, especially with a graphic novel and doing what you're doing. You know, it's not just the written word. So it's the same kind of thing for me and for this channel. Um, but anyway, as far as how we're going to use this or how I'd like to use this, uh, as long as you're cool with it, is uh, I'll just clip up the relevant bits. I'm going to tell the story as I've seen it. Um, yeah. You know, I'm probably going to do some comparisons with, you know, we don't say Albert Einstein, you know, little things like that. Like, let's do some, yeah. hey, why do we pronounce it like Epstein? Well, probably yeah. because it's ingrained in our heads, especially as Americans. You know, we just Americanize everything. Your name might be another one of those examples. Um, but kind of paint that picture a little bit and then drop into the interview and say, hey, but here's a guy who really knows Brian, unlike anybody else probably at this point. Because I've, I've heard the interviews. Um Fat Four Free For All. It's one of my favorite podcasts. So the guys yep. over there, Mitch Axelrod, I know Mitch. Uh, so going back to the, to when you were on their show, that was kind of what planted the seed for me. Was uh -huh. can I can I drop in and then maybe kind of extract some of that and you know with Skype with some of the other visual stuff, just tell the story. Right. It's just a cool little nugget of a story. Um, 
You know, at some point, I'd love, gosh, I can think of a dozen stories that I'd love to tell on Brian visually. Oh, this yeah. Might be, this might be a good I, intro for it. Yeah, right on. All right, All great. Right. So, yeah, let's jump in and let's start off with um, you personally. What yeah. is your, your connection to the Beatles, but more specifically, Brian? Like, how did that unfold for you? Sure. So, um, so I'm the Vake Tawari. I'm the author of The Fifth Beetle, the Brian Epstein story, which is a graphic novel uh, and forthcoming uh, television event series. The book is being adapted into a TV series uh, based on the life of Brian Epstein. And I discovered Brian when I was in business school. I was at the Wharton School of Business, dreaming about being an entrepreneur in the arts and entertainment industries. And Wharton in 1991, when I entered the school, didn't have resources for young people like me who were interested in the arts. It, they, they do now, but back then, being interested in studying the business of the arts was what made me the black sheep of business school. And uh, believing that the Beatles and Brian wrote and then rewrote the rules of the pop music business, I thought if I'm going to work in that industry, I should study the lives of the great uh, entrepreneurs and I should start with Brian Epstein. So that that was initially where my um, where my desire to study Brian came from. Uh, lifelong Beatles fan. Uh, I joke that I listened to the Beatles even before I was born because my parents were Beatles fans and they had the Beatles playing while I was in the womb. Um, and so uh, so I started coming to this study of Brian by being a Beatles fan, as we all do. Right. And uh, and I wanted to know the business of the Beatles. I was a Beatles fan and I was a business student. So I wanted to know how did he come up with the suits and the haircuts? How did he get them a record deal when no one wanted to sign them? How did he convince Ed Sullivan to book the band when a British band had never made an impact in the United States? And th those are really the things that most people know about Brian. You know, Brian did those things. He was the guy that imaged the band and came up with the suits and the haircuts and taught them how to bow after their their uh, stage performances. He was the guy that convinced uh, you know George Martin to sign the Beatles when every single record label in the UK, including George Martin's label, had passed on the band already. He was the guy that convinced Ed Sullivan to book the band when a British band had never made an impact over, over here in the United States. He was the guy that engineered Beatlemania behind the scenes and gave the world the Beatles. And that in itself is very inspiring to me and was inspiring to me when I was a business school student uh, uncovering that story. But the real heart of why Brian Epstein st struck a deep chord for me was the human side of his story. He was gay and Jewish and from Liverpool. And in the 1960s, those were three tremendous obstacles. Uh, it was a felony to be gay in the United Kingdom. Uh, Anti-Semitism is rampant in the country in a way that it isn't right now. And Liverpool, prior to the Beatles, is a port town in the north of England without any cultural influence whatsoever. No one was looking to Liverpool for the next big musical act. Um, so Brian Epstein really was the ultimate outsider. And as a first generation American, my family is originally of Indian origin, um, I was an outsider as well. What I was supposed to do with my life was become a doctor or an engineer or study technology. Sure. I wasn't yeah. supposed to write graphic novels and, and write, uh, produce television shows and Broadway musicals. You know, that's crazy. You know, and, and so in much the same way that Brian Epstein was the gay Jewish kid running around a dirty pork town in the north of England telling people the Beatles are going to be bigger than Elvis. With my help, I'm, the Beatles are going to elevate pop music into an art form. You know, that was very inspiring to the weirdo Indian kid running around New York's Lower East Side that I was saying, I'm going to write graphic novels and I'm going to produce Broadway musicals. Um, so that's my connection to the story. And and really having researched Brian's life. From uh, from my business school days till now, for for the past twenty years, um, I really have become a, a bit of an expert on Brian Epstein. But it really came from a place of personal inspiration, and uh, and that's my that's my story. That's fantastic. So you, the the interest that you had specifically during your business school years, how yeah. was that received? Um, your your passion for the Beatles and specifically. Uh, Brian's management style and his story and all that. How was that received? Like, did you have to twist arms to get people to listen that, hey, this guy really knew what he was doing? It wasn't just a flash in the pan kind of thing? Yeah, it's interesting because, you know, when I started researching Brian uh, in 91, there's no YouTube, there's no Wikipedia, there's no Google. You know, so so I really had no choice and there are no books about Brian. You know, The Fifth Beetle is the only book in print about Brian Epstein. Um, as a quick aside, Ray Coleman's The Man Who Made the Beatles, a wonderful book. It's been out of print for a number of years. Um, and in 1991, there's no used book websites. There's no Amazon marketplace There are none of these things that you can you can get access to even used books. You know, for that matter, it was pre-anthology. 
That's oh yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, I mean, I had no choice but to read the the great Beatles books and learn about who were the people that knew Brian and then track them down and get them to talk to me. You know, and that's literally what I would do. I would read these five, six hundred page books about the Beatles. I'd get maybe ten or eleven pages about Brian, and and knowing what I know now, those pages were full of misinformation and half truths. Hmm. But what I did was I painted a picture in my head of the people who knew him. Uh, people like Sid Bernstein, you know, the legendary concert promoter who brought the Beatles over to the U.S. for the first time. Uh, Nat Weiss, who was uh, became Brian's best friend, but was the Beatles' U.S. attorney and became Brian's also a close confidant on both business uh, issues and personal issues. And and then I just cold called these people. And I said, I'm a, a young person who's interested in learning more about Brian Epstein. The little bit he knows, the little bit I know has been very inspiring to me. And w- will you talk to me? And uh, literally not one of them said no. Uh, you know, and, and the phrase I use is I was so excited about reaching out to these folks that I forgot to be intimidated. <laughs> uh, so, so it, you know, in actually getting people to talk to me about Brian Epstein proved to be much easier than 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 perhaps uh, you might think it would have been or, or perhaps that, that it, I might have thought it would have been if I had allowed myself to be intimidated, you know. And um, and then when I tried to sort of. Um, you know, so, so that was in there. That was when I was doing my research. Right. And at the time I was just looking for personal inspiration. I wasn't writing a screenplay or a graphic novel or anything like that. I was just looking for my own knowledge. Right. So fast forward to, you know, a decade after that. And I decided that I did want to tell the Brian Epstein story that it hadn't been told and that I wanted to do it in graphic novel form and eventually in television form. And then I reached back out to these folks and I said, you know, and at this point, a number of them had become friends. And I said, when we first sat down, I was just looking for personal inspiration. But now I want to tell this story. And are you okay with that? And will you answer additional questions and sort of support me in that process? And they all said yes, I'm very happy to say. Um, And a number of them said, if anyone's going to tell their story, his story, it should be you because you care deeply about it. Um, you know, I described Brian as my historical mentor. You know, he died in 67 and I was born in 73. So I never got to meet him. But he is still one of the great mentors of my life. You know, I've studied his life meticulously enough that that he, he his story has, has been inspiring to me, has inspired every aspect of my professional life and a number of aspects of my personal life. So he is really one of my mentors. He's a historical mentor, a mentor from history. Um, and so, you know, when I when I decided to tell his story and I started to put it into graphic novel form and uh, and I started to become a talking head about Brian Epstein, if you will, you know, the fact that my re- my knowledge about Brian mostly came from firsthand interviews and from people who knew him, worked with him. And, and by the way, not just his friends. I spoke to friends, enemies, people who thought Brian was was not a good manager, people who loved Brian. Every, you know, Let's I spoke give the complete story, on, right? All sides, sides of the coin. Yeah. And the fact that that's where my information was coming from made people take me very seriously. You know, and, and so so even though a number of things that I had to, to talk to about to, to reveal or discuss about Brian, including the pronunciation of his name, which I know we'll get to in a few minutes. Um, you know, even though a, a number of those, the things I was saying went contrary to the the popular beliefs about Brian, people did take me very seriously. I didn't have to twist too many arms because I said, look, this I'm getting it straight from the, the sources, you know. So and, and that's um, that's often the best way to state your case, right, with with proper research behind you. Absolutely. I really appreciate your passion behind this because you. You, you were digging deep, especially before before you knew that you even wanted to do, to do a platform, which is probably why the Sid Bernsteins of the world were like, OK, now if you want to go somewhere with this, you'd already have the foundation that showed you weren't just in it for yourself. Yeah, that's, no, that's exactly right. I mean, you know, Brian was a huge fan of bullfighting. Right. So as part of my research, I studied bullfighting like oh, I was, man. Uh, I wasn't a huge fan of bullfighting and, and I don't want to go off on too much of a tangent, but that was strange to me. You know, I grew up in New York City, like we didn't have bullfighting, right? We had the Yankees, you know, so and the Mets. So so uh, so I was like, here's a guy who dedicated his entire life or his entire adult life to helping a band spread a message of love around the world, right? She loves you, lovely Rita, all you need is love. Like that's what he spent his life doing. And he was a huge fan of what seemed to me to be a very brutal and violent and sport. I'm a vegetarian, right? Like I didn't understand bullfighting. So I wanted to know how could a guy like Brian be interested in bullfighting? So I studied bullfighting, you know, and and a lot of historians who just care a little bit about learning the story of the Beatles, they're not gonna 
you know, start studying bullfighting, you know, and, and again, not to go off on a too, too much of a tangent, but what I understood is like, what, what I learned is that bullfighting is a very beautiful and theatrical sport. And Brian was very into theatrics. Theater. And, yeah. You know, and so that appealed to him. Brian was gay and the, the bullfighters were often very handsome and young. That appealed to him, you know, and the story of bullfighters, bullfighters, most of them um, started their life as, as peasants, as poor people from small towns. And they raised themselves up and became matadors. And, and in so doing, they inspired their small town. They inspired the country. They inspired the nation. And that's kind of the Brian Epstein story. Brian was a gay Jewish kid from Liverpool, you know, so you could understand how the story of the small town kid from a from a random town in in, uh, in Spain making his way to the bull rings in Madrid would be inspiring to somebody like Brian. All of a sudden it, it crystallized, you know, yeah. that's the kind of research that I, that I did for Brian, you know, when he did a. a you know, a desert island discs uh, story said like, if you were stuck on a desert island, like what, 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 so, what album would you take with you? What book would you take with you? You know, and he, and he said, oh, I would take the book Elected Silence by Thomas Merton, a book about a monk going into into uh, seclusion. Like, that's very interesting. But you know what I did? Like, I read the book. You know, like I bought that book, that huge book, and I, I read it because I was like, I feel like you can get, learn more about Brian Epstein by reading that book and by studying bullfighting than in reading a number of these Beatles books, with, with no offense uh, to, uh, meant to the, to the Beatles historians. But if you really want to get into somebody's life, yes, of course, you need to read those history books. But you also need to do that deeper dive of research, you know. So anyway, I'm, I'm rambling now. No, I, I appreciate that, especially the Merton bit. I hadn't heard that. Uh, I'm in Western Kentucky. Thomas Merton was at the Abbey, which is about two hours east of here. And I'm no. Catholic, so there, there's a connection there. Uh, I've read Seven Story Mountain. I mean, so all that stuff, if you dig into the Merton Merton world, I did I mean, not know that about Brian. How interesting is that, right? Brian is a Jewish kid. Right, right. Liverpool. And that's the book that he would have taken with him if he was stuck on a desert island. I've got, I've got another book to, to add to my collection. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Speaking of books uh, and books that I've, I've read, um, as a teenager, let's see, I was 13 when Anthology came out. So I'm an Anthology kid. You know, you've got the first generation fans that were Dead Sullivan fans and all that, right? And then you've got kind of the later folks who were maybe they were on the younger side, but they remember Lennon dying. They remember him being, yeah. being murdered, you know? So that's there was a I little bit of a generation just, gap. Yeah, but yeah. Right. And yeah, then yeah. you've got, you know, whatever, and I, not to put generation labels on it, but you've got kind of the next phase and people who are in probably their 30s and 40s now that yeah. grew up with the anthology leaving an impression on them. And yep. I was one of those. So I remember reading Cellar Full of Noise when the Beetle Bug hit me. Gosh, that was one of the first Beatles books that I got because I wanted to hear it as it was told in the 60s. You know, I, there were all the modern bios that you could read on them. And sure. I also had anthology for that. But something that told the story kind of as it unfolded. Cellar Full of Noise was 64, 65? Something. Uh, would I, yeah. I'm you know what? We should we should look it up. I don't want to get it wrong, but I think it's sixty four. I think that's so, right. Yeah. But point being, early, early in the career, it was before Sergeant Pepper's. It was before you know. So Brian doesn't even get into some of the more interesting business stuff of the Beatles. Um, but yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, so so I remember that that sticking out with me uh, and his story, uh, his his eloquence. It was almost prose the way that he did this. And you know, there's some audio recordings of him reading this. And uh, it, it clashed with the leather jacket impression of the Beatles that you had from the Hamburg days. So it totally yeah. makes sense, or it made sense to me, even as a younger younger fan, hearing that he was the guy responsible for them going That's from right. the leather jackets to the collarless suits, That's to the right. mouths yeah. and all that. Yeah. yeah. So I, I get that. You definitely took it a step further, though, doing your homework. So. Uh, Great story, I was, man. I was passionate about it. It was inspiring to me. So, you know, that's the best kind of research when it inspires you, you know? Yeah. Uh, I went to uh, Beetle Fest in 98, 99. So, again, as a teenager, my huh? parents let me go to Chicago, six hours north, to go hang out with all these adults that I'd met on the internet. I mean, it was the craziest thing, but the late 90s were weird like that. Different time, right? Yeah. yeah. But, I mean, yeah. no, Mom, I promise I met them on an AOL chat room. They're like, they're legit people. And they were. And they were right. Not, not that I would tell my kids this nowadays, but you know, Time's changed. We'll, yeah. we'll talk about it later. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but I remember meeting Martin Lewis at uh -huh. the time. Are you? Sure. Did you uh, do you uh, have a relationship with him? Did that come out yeah, of? Uh, did, absolutely. Because he he did so much homework. I remember back in the day, even he had the campaign for Brian to be inducted into the, sure. the Hall of Fame 
20 years ago, you know? Yeah. I met Martin at a, at a Beatles fest, just like you did many, many years ago. And he became a friend. Um, I, 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 we, I just, it's been a long time since I've spoken to him just cause we've been busy. It's probably been a, a little over a year or two years, maybe it's, I, I'm due, I'm due for a phone call. I should, I should, you're inspiring me to pick up the phone and give him a call. It's been a really? while. Um, but, the, but there's no question. Martin was a guy that I spoke to quite uh, often while I was doing my research. Um, he, you know, hit the reading a cellar full of noise as he, he wrote that introduction right. to the Rhino version of that book, um, which is uh, it's a beautiful introduction. It's a beautiful test tribute to Brian. And um, and God bless Mar Bra uh, Martin for that. And um, yes, he was very involved in that petition to induct Brian into the Hall of Fame. And so, Bri you know, I know that um, that Brian Epstein is somebody that Martin cares very deeply about. And so we definitely bonded over that. Yeah, you know, I, for, I figured there was a connection wow. there, but I, I didn't want to assume. That's awesome. Yeah, no, no, I haven't spoken to Martin in a little while, though. But uh, but yes, no, I'm very fond of him. Well, tell him I appreciate his work. Um, does he still wear pink socks? I, you know, as I said, it's been a few years, so I, I don't want to speak <laughs> out of turn and say say yes, and then it's not true. You know, <laughs> it's been a little while. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, that I, I remember that about him. That stood out. That was the first time that I'd seen somebody do like fashion, but then have this like loud accessory. And, you know, again, a Kentucky kid, that's, that's not something that I saw a lot of, especially back that's in those funny. days, you know, yeah, kind, yeah. Of, kind of pre mainstream internet anyway, yeah. but that stood out. Um, so let's, let's jump into the pronunciation. Yeah. Great. Everybody says, I mean, you, you, uh, you watch the anthology going back to that. You hear the interviews. It's Epstein, Epstein, Epstein. That's yeah. the way I've always said it. Yeah. Um, there's a parallel here too. I recently did a video on the Esher demos. So the pre-White Album demos that they recorded at George's house in yep. Esher, Surrey, not Escher, but an Americanization. We've always said the Escher demos. You know, you get the bootlegs. It's the Escher demos. Here it is. So they finally released it. And you've got these clips of Giles Martin saying Esher, Esher, Esher. Well, if, <laughs> right. if you ask a Brit, they're yeah. going, well, yeah, of course it's Esher. Well, we've uh. just been saying it wrong. So I make this video all about the Esher demos. And I'm saying it correctly because I want to get it right, you know. Yeah. And then all the folks in the comment section are like, um, of course. It's, it's Escher. So that was kind of, it, it was not only the conversation that I heard you have on the Fab Four Free For All podcast, but it was also that kind of thing that I was like, sure. I am saying this correctly. Why, why aren't other folks understanding that this is the right yeah. way to say it? And yeah. so that, that's kind of what sparked the idea for me was to, uh, to talk to you. But Epstein, let's, let's jump into it. Brian yeah. himself, what did he say? If he walked up to the microphone and said, hello, good afternoon, I'm Brian, what would Brian say? Well, that's a good question. You know, I, I, and I think it, it depends. You know, Br Brian lived in a different time. You know, as I as I said earlier, he lived at a time where it was against the law to be gay, and he was gay. He lived at a time of pervasive anti-Semitism, and he was Jewish. He lived at a time where, specifically to his business, Jews did not work extensively in the music business, especially not in the United Kingdom. He wasn't the only one. But it, the business wasn't run by Jewish people. You know, it was run by people like Sir Joseph Lockwood, uh, you know, um, white Christian knights of the British Empire. You know, I mean, that that has largely changed. If you follow the music industry, you know, there's a lot of there's many powerful Jewish executives in the business. But that just wasn't the case back then. So so in large part, it would depend on who Brian was talking to. You know, the last thing that he would want to do is draw attention to his name, you know, and uh, as as we'll have this conversation, like I don't have video of Brian saying the correct way to pronounce my name is, you know, so 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 we don't have that kind of uh, of answer to your question about like, you know, and I don't think Brian would have uh, have corrected someone. You know, so so I think if somebody came up to him and said, hello, Mr. Epstein, blah, 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 as they did, he would go on with the conversation, you know, um, and, and there's no question about this, that if you look in the old video, you will find video of the Beatles calling him Brian Epstein. Billy J. Kramer is a dear friend of mine. He wrote the introduction to the graphic novel, to my graphic novel, The Fifth Beatle. Billy has been saying Brian Epstein, you know, is Billy wrong? Well, I guess it depends on what you mean by wrong. You know, if uh, if if Billy was calling Brian, Brian Epstein and Brian wasn't correcting him, you know, is that OK? I guess it is. If it did, it didn't bother Brian. I guess it's OK. Um, but in my research, you know, I went to what I consider the source, which is the family. Brian Epstein's family says Epstein. You know, that is the way the family pronounced their name. You know, and the source that I that I would quote is Brian's mom. <laughs> Brian's mother says the way the correct way to pronounce my family's name is Epstein. And the fact that everybody called my son Epstein, they said it wrong. 
You know, so so, you know, if everyone, including the Beatles and Billy J. Kramer, were saying his name incorrectly, does that all of a sudden make it correct? I would say no. You know, I would say the correct way to pronounce one's family name is how one's family says it. And, uh, you know, I spoke to Joanne Epstein, who is uh, a Brian's niece and, um, you know, knew her grandmother very, very well. And she said, told me that, like, her grandmother was very insistent and a little annoyed that people would be saying the, the name incorrectly. The correct way to say it is Epstein. And so that's how I have dedicated myself to saying it. And, uh, and I'm glad we're having this conversation because the truth is, you know, I consider myself an expert on the life of Brian Epstein. And, uh, you know, and I'll talk about this and there'll be a number of uh, people who will immediately, especially in the days of social media and trolls, will be like, you know, this guy's an idiot. He's not even saying the guy's name right. right. And the truth is like, well, actually, I'm not an idiot. And I'm one of the few people who is saying it correctly. You know, the fact that John Lennon has a song that, you know, in the demos that say, what about Brian Epstein? Like that doesn't make the pronunciation correct. <laughs> it just doesn't, right. you know, like, and I love John. I'm a huge John Lennon fan, but like, you know, John Lennon's, it was wrong. You know, like uh, uh, there, have I, have I committed Beatles blasphemy <laughs> by saying John Lennon was wrong, but he was wrong. John Lennon called his manager Brian Epstein, and he was wrong. <laughs> you know, <laughs> there you have it. You know, I, I mean, and again, it depends on on on, on how you uh, how you view history, right? To me, to me, the correct way to pronounce somebody's name is the way the family pronounces the name. This is not really splitting hairs. This is not uh, this is not noting a tiny little footnote that doesn't deserve to be told. And I think it's because of the other stuff that you mentioned. Uh, yeah, homosexuality. His, his Jewish beliefs, all that ties into it, like what you said earlier about him yeah. not wanting to correct somebody. He was also yeah. polite. He was a very, very polite man. And there would be something that if his end goal is to get people to do what he needs them to do for the Beatles to have success, for himself to have success, exactly. his family, he's going to go with that. And if he's going to exactly. step on somebody's toes by saying, hey, you're pronouncing my name wrong, he's not the kind of guy who's going to do that, is my understanding. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, I mean, I, I believe, you know, so so here so here we go, right? If, if the correct way to say the name is Epstein, if that's how the family has said the name, the, the correct way in our family is to say Epstein, then like, why doesn't Brian correct people? Like, right, that's a good question. And I don't know the answer to that question because Brian isn't alive for us to ask. But having done a tremendous amount of research on him, and as we said earlier, not just uh, historical factual research, but sort of what I consider more poetic research. The guy was a bullfighter. Let me understand why he liked bullfighting. The guy said that he would have taken Thomas Merton's book with him to a desert island. Let me read that book and try to understand why that might be the case. You know, that's the kind of research I, I did on Brian. So I feel that I can speak with as much, uh, as much accuracy or as intelligence as anyone alive can as to what Brian may have been thinking. And so this is just speculation, but here's what I believe. I believe there are two reasons that Brian didn't correct people. The first, probably the, the main one, is I think he probably didn't care. You know, like he probably just probably wasn't that important to him, you know? Um, my name is V-I-V-E-K and, it, and it's pronounced Vivek is the correct way to say it, but it looks like Vivek. You know, and when I, and I grew up in New York City and growing up, um, all my friends, my, my, my young friends, they called me Vivek and I didn't care. And so I, that was OK. You know, like and in fact, if you meet my oldest friends in the world, they will call me Vivek. And it, and it doesn't bother me at all. You know, and, and growing up, there were also no Indians in my circle of friends who just would know instinctively that the name is pronounced Vivek. Now, all of a sudden, when I get to, got to college, around about the same time I started studying Brian's life, I was at the University of Pennsylvania, and all of a sudden there, and the Wharton School of Business, and all of a sudden, at both UPenn and Wharton, there were lots of Indians, and they would meet, and they would instinctively just call me Vivek, because they knew that's how their name was pronounced. And all of a sudden, my non-Indian friends would hear that, and they would be like, why are they saying it that, that way? And I was like, well, you know, because I didn't care that much, I was, uh, so I didn't correct them. I was like, well, actually, that's the right way to pronounce my name. And, uh, and so all of a sudden my non-Indian friends were like, well, if that's the right way to pronounce your name, like we want to say it correct too. And so all of a sudden more and more people started calling me Vivek and I sort of, re and people start, and people would also ask me like, well, what do you prefer? And as I stopped and thought about it, I was like, well, it doesn't matter to me that much, but I guess I pr prefer the correct way to say it. So all of a sudden my friends were like, well, that's what we're going to call you, you know? And then, and then I sort of realized that, and I was, you know, I was a, a freshman in college and I was, I was a young person. I was like, there were, you know, I should be, my name should be pronounced correctly. That's what I'm going to say. I'm going to say Vivek, but it's, it's the same thing, right? Like, I don't think 
Epstein, Epstein bothered him. So I think he just didn't care to correct people. I think that's probably the biggest answer. The biggest reason is that he, it just didn't bother him. Epstein, Epstein, I don't care. You know, like, so, uh, how, so that that's, I think, num reason number one. Reason number two um, is that I think, you know, you have to remember at the time, at, in the early 1960s, you know, Brian was an outsider. You know, I mentioned this earlier, so I'm probably repeating myself, but he was gay at a time when it was against the law. And in, in particular to this question about his name, Jewish at a time of pervasive anti-Semitism. There's still anti-Semitism in the world today, but it was far more pervasive in the UK then than it is now. It's not like it's gone now, but it was worse back then, right? Um, you know, th this, uh, one of the things we probably all love about the Beatles is how funny they are. You know, like if you've seen, you know, any, all of those old Beatles press conferences, they never answer a question with a straight answer. They're very fast on their feet. They're very witty. And if you've spent any time in Liverpool, you'll know this is a very Scouse thing. You know, this is a very Liverpool, Liverpudlian trait. You know, the Beatles happen to be particularly good at it, but any, anybody from Liverpool is kind of funny and good and, and with, with their witticisms like right. that. You know, not so funny in the 1960s if you were Jewish, because you face that kind of repartee witticism wrapped up with anti-Semitic jokes every single day of your life. You know, that's the world that Brian Epstein grew up in, right? And so if he is beginning, a, a, and keep in mind, we're talking, and so the other thing I was going to say is like early 1960s, the Beatles, they became massive superstars. They weren't in 1961 when Brian first met them, right? Like every record label in the UK passed on them. Ed Sullivan was not interested in booking the band. A British band had never made an impact in the United States. The Beatles in the United Kingdom had reached a point where they had played for the Queen and the UK press had, had coined a term, Beatlemania, and still the US could have cared less. The fact that the Beatles had performed for the Queen of England made them a novelty act over here. You know, So Brian Epstein had his work cut out for him, first in the UK, where every record label had passed on them, and then he made them huge successes in the UK, and no one over here cared about that, so then he <laughs> had his work cut out for him a second time over here, right? Yeah. So when he's sitting in these in these meetings or on the telephone doing his job as a manager and the first thing he hears from the person across the table is like, well, Mr. Epstein, tell me about your band. Like he's not going to start by saying, well, actually, the correct way to pronounce my name is Epstein. And while I'm at it, may maybe I'm insulting you and maybe I'm also drawing attention to the fact that I'm Jewish and it's a period of intense <laughs> anti-Semitism. Right. That wouldn't make any business sense. The right. correct thing to do is move on is to say is to forget about the fact that somebody just mispronounced his name and move on to the business at hand. Right. So I think that's reason number two is that that people in business circles in the UK and in the US saw E.P.S.T.E.I.N. and instinctively called him Epstein. Um, and he didn't want to correct that because he didn't want to draw attention to the fact that his name was being pronounced incorrectly. You know? I think you drew a very interesting parallel with your own name there, uh, saying that it didn't really bother you until it, until it came up, until it, did. until it was like, oh, so somebody else is calling you something different than what I've been calling you. For me, it kind of begs the question now, granted, it's, it's a hypothetical, but if somebody said, actually, Brian, how, how would you like it preferred or pronounced? You know, I can imagine an interview, television, radio, I can imagine that coming up and Brian said, well, it, it doesn't really bother me, but if you want it to be one or the other, my family has always said Epstein. Like, you can almost imagine that unfolding very diplomatically, yeah. very tactfully. Yeah, it's funny. You know, the, these kind of what ifs are always hard to, hard to answer. Like, like, what if Brian had lived? Would he have been able to keep the Beatles together? You know, uh, people love to ask these sorts of questions. And, you know, the, the truth is, you know, as I said, Brian was really an outsider in the 60s being gay and Jewish. And the world is in a different place right now. There's plenty of... Uh, of anti-Semitism and homophobia, there's no question about it, you know? But here we are in America where, you know, gay people can get married, you know? The freedom to marry fight was won several years ago, and that's a beautiful thing, and there's still lots more work to do. Please don't get me wrong, I'm not suggesting that uh, the, the LGBTQ community has it easy, they do not. Um, however, it's not against the law the way it was when Brian, yeah. in, you know, re relatively speaking, it's a, it's a, it's a world in which LGBTQ stories are being told, 
you know, put it that way in the arts and entertainment industries that, that, that I work in and that you work in, like those stories are being told, you know, there's a, there was a movie about Alan Turing, you know, like, uh, and, and, and his struggles as a gay man. Um, you know, th these are not, uh, stories that people don't want to hear. We're in a world where people want to hear the stories of the LGBTQ community. And the reason I'm bringing this all up is that I think if Brian was asked today, he may, he may have said, yeah, you know, you should call me Epstein. That's the correct way to say it, you know, but that he may have given you a different answer in 2019 than he would have given you in 1966. Fair point. Great point. That's my point. Like if he was asked in 1966, how do you pronounce the name? Maybe he would have just said, you know what? People are saying Epstein and that's fine. You know, because he just didn't want to just didn't want to make a big deal about it. That wasn't you his know? goal. That wasn't his focus I at the time. That he, if he had lived there, would, he would have reached a period where like, you know what? Like the world needs to know that I'm get Brian would have come out by 2019, you know, but in Brian's lifetime, he was in, living in fear of it coming out because it would have gotten him thrown in jail, you know, but had Brian lived, I think that he would have, uh, you know, and ironically, he was spending more time in the United States at the end of his life where it, again, it wasn't, it wasn't, uh, socially acceptable <laughs> to be gay, but at least it wasn't against the law, right? Right. And so I could see him living a life where eventually, and I don't know when it would have been 1970, 1980, 1990, but at some point I could imagine Brian shifting his gears a little bit and becoming a little bit more of an activist and standing up for himself as a Jewish man and saying like, you know what, I'm proud of my Jewish heritage and my name is Epstein. And I'm proud of the fact that I'm a gay man. You know, and I'm going to join some some LGBTQ causes and lend my 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 whatever power I have in the arts and entertainment industries to push that agenda forward. His band was certainly doing it. You know, I think he, John, I think Brian would have been very proud of the political activism that John Lennon took on in his later life. And I think Brian might have might have also done the same for LGBTQ and Jewish issues. And at that point in his life, at that point, when Brian reached a point where he decided I'm going to fight for Jewish issues, and I'm gonna fight against anti-Semitism. That would have been the point where he would have said, and my name is pronounced Epstein, and my mother always told me <laughs> that that's how people should be pronouncing my name, and I ignored her all these years, but I'm gonna stop ignoring her now. I love, I love the what ifs. I love exploring this yeah. with people who really know what they're talking about, who understand that these are not just characters that we've read about, yeah. book yeah. after book. I mean, they're, they're real people. You know, They're not just historical figures. Uh, so I, I really appreciate your insight on that. Speaking and of, look, let me say it again: the what ifs are what ifs. Who knows, right? Sure, sure. Uh, you know, I'm just one person uh, with with one opinion. Like you'll you'll meet people who knew Brian. I never met the guy. Like you know, you'll meet people who knew him who will probably tell you something different. You know, everybody has their own opinions about this, this kind of stuff, and and there's mine for whatever it may be worth. I love it. I love it. I, worth a lot but, but you know some some of your your listeners and viewers might disagree and they're everybody's entitled to their own opinion about this stuff i, I completely understand i appreciate the caveat there is something to be said though for when you have spoken to family members when you've spoken to experts yeah. when you've spoken to personal friends it really shines light on on things that you know your conjecture may be worth a little bit more than somebody who's just again read 10 or 12 uh, I mean pages out of a book that's exactly right. Look, look, I, I think it's a what if is like, what, what, when would Brian have, uh, would Brian ever have uh, decided to, to try to correct everyone who's been saying it wrong? And if so, when would that have happened? Like that's conjecture. But I will throw down that it is not up for debate the correct way to pronounce Epstein or Epstein. It is not up for debate. The correct way to pronounce Brian's last name is Epstein. And why is that not up for debate? Because that's how the family says it. If the Beatles say it incorrectly and Billy J. Kramer says it incorrectly and Brian's assistants said it incorrectly and all the video that you pull up in the anthology says it incorrectly, well, guess what? It's still incorrect. You know, it doesn't make it incorrect. Yeah, I mean, I'm sorry, it doesn't make it correct. You know, yeah. I mean, like and last names are, are how we identify our family, right? Isn't that, that's what a last name is. A last name is a statement of family. And if a last name is a statement of family and the family says the name is pronounced Epstein, then it should follow by simple logic that the name is pronounced Epstein. And I, I would say that is not up for debate. And I don't care what any Beatles historian or what any video footage you show me 
uh, would suggest otherwise. How about that? <laughs> Sorry, I'm getting a little angry. No, there, no, I appreciate your passion, man. I'm not mad at you. No, no, I love the intensity. This you is know, it's it's, fun. Uh, it's just something I want to throw down because, like, you know, it's funny as we said. Like, you, you'll get this, like, the comments, especially on social media, when people when people don't have to look you in the face. The amount of co- times where people are like, "This guy's an idiot. Like, he can't even pronounce his name correctly. Why should I believe anything Vivek has to say about Brian when he doesn't even know how to pronounce his name?" It's like, well, do your research, my friend. You know. Yeah, I did a video on. Have you ever read anything about the Bernard Purdy controversy? No. Oh. So I've got yeah. a video on that. Go check it out if you want to. If you want to kill about ten or twelve minutes, it's a fascinating story. Bernard Purdy, session drummer, legendary guy. He's played on a ton of stuff, like a lot of Steely Dan tracks. I mean, just stuff that is like iconic in American rock and roll, like in the rock, American rock catalog. Great guy. He said that he replaced Ringo's tracks on a lot of things because Ringo wasn't cutting it that they brought him in. You know, I haven't heard about this. I don't know the story, but I've heard so about I, I did a whole video on it, and it's fascinating to hear the people who are going, man, thank you for shedding light on that, versus the people going, I don't know, I believe him, and I've got like eight minutes of documentation going, he said this, but here's what happened. He said this, but here's what happened. And the uh, it, it, they're not even trolling within the comments. They're just... I don't know if it's ignorance. I don't know if they've just planted themselves so deep, but I understand what you're saying. I deal with it every day. Thousands of comments. I, I've got to go grow a thick skin or stop doing it. I'll yeah. choose the former. You know? Well, look, I mean, we, we also, you know, we live in a very interesting time in 2019 in America where fake news oh my gosh. Has, become a, has become a, um, you know, a phrase. In fact, there was a, I think it just, what just came out today. There's an article in the New York Times, an interview that our, you know, our president Donald Trump gave the New York Times specifically to talk about the phrase fake news, right? I mean, this, so it's a very, very interesting thing. And, and we certainly live in an era um, at least in America, where in, if enough people say a thing, it gets taken for truth, you know? And look, at the end of the day, the pronunciation of the Beatles manager's last name isn't a world-changing thing. Right. But, but, but I think in 2019, of all eras, we can appreciate the, the mere fact that just because a lot of people say something doesn't make it true. And we're seeing that a lot in our world, in, in our world of politics that just because a lot of people say a thing doesn't make it true. One needs to do their fact checking. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and if you fact check this one, you'll, you'll come up with Epstein. I'm a big believer that if you get the little things right, you're probably gonna get the bigger things right. If you ignore the little things, pretend like they don't matter, my trust in you is gonna be a little bit less for even the bigger things. So yeah, this, this is just one of those, you know, it, I, again, I really don't think it's splitting hairs. I think it does matter. Does it matter as much as human rights issues? Probably not in the grand scheme, but That's it right. is nice to know that, you know, they're still black and white. They're still right and wrong. And this is one of those examples. Uh, yeah. Let's talk about your current projects and what you're working on, Vivek. It's uh, it's absolutely fascinating to me that the story of the Beatles manager has become a really cool graphic novel. And it's Thanks. it's it's got a life beyond that, though. This is going somewhere yeah. else. Can you fill me in on what's happening there? Yeah, it does indeed. So we are adapting it uh, for television. We're turning it into a television limited event series, as they say in the TV world. Um, The current plan is six to eight one hour episodes. It might may wind up being more than that. Um, But it's uh, it's going to be somewhere between six and eight one hour episodes. And the most exciting piece of news about that is that we have secured access to Beatles music. Uh, So we will. Congratulations. um, That's that's rare. Thank you. No, it is the first and only time to date in history that um, that that a, a non-documentary film about the Beatles has had access to the entire Lennon McCartney catalog. Um, you know, you there you see other Beatles movies like Backbeat, Nowhere Boy, etc. And there's no Beatles music in those movies. Um, and uh, and so we're very proud that we're going to be able to have Beatles music in the, to tell the Brian Epstein story. Um, and we have done a deal with Sonar Entertainment. Sonar are a very well-respected, very well-heeled television production studio. And they are not connected to a particular network. So Sonar is able to sell shows to every network. They've had shows everywhere from MTV and VH1 to the BBC to Fox. Um, so I'm very excited about that because I think that internationally, the Brian Epstein story is a, is a story that will be interesting 
anywhere around the world. So the fact that we can sell it to a, one particular network or streamcaster in the US and perhaps a different streamcaster or network in the UK and a different one in India and a different one in Japan um, will allow us to make sure that the story gets told as widely as possible um, all over the world, which is really my my agenda here. My agenda is that I believe, you know, everywhere, everyone around the world knows who the Beatles are. Everyone around the world should know who Brian Epstein is. And, and why? Because the Brian Epstein story is inspiring. I think the message of the Brian Epstein story is that no dream is too impossible and no person too unlikely to realize that dream. And that is a message that every human being everywhere around the world should hear. It inspired me to chase my dreams, and I hope that the Brian Epstein story will inspire others to chase their, their dreams. And the fact that um, we are adapting the graphic novel to television, a media, a medium, excuse me, that um, you know, television is a medium that is very powerful right now. TV is, a, is a, some people say it's in a golden age, you know, but a lot of people are watching TV, and um, now that there's a lot of streaming television, that's opening up the boundaries of television even further. So the fact that we're gonna be able to adapt it to a medium that can just help me reach more and more people, it's tremendously exciting. And, uh, and also, as you know, you know the graphic novel, as you know, you've read it, is, is very thin. It's 120 some odd pages. And I did that on purpose. You know, I wanted the graphic novel to be something that somebody could pick up, even if they're not a huge Beatles fan, even if they're not a huge comic fan, they could flip through it. They could see it's, you know, it's a it's, you know, fourteen ninety nine in paperback. Like, you know, it doesn't cost much. I could read this. You know, if you're in I kept thinking of the airport bookstore, if you picked it up at an airport bookstore. You could think no matter how short your flight is, you could probably finish it by the time your flight lands. You know, you know, I might just give it a chance, right? So that was my, my agenda with the book is I wanted it to be a quick read and a fun read, you know? Um, and so that's why it's so thin. But I've been researching Brian's uh, life for literally more than, more than half my own life, you know? Um, and so I have a tremendous amount of, of knowledge about Brian and the idea that now I can expand that knowledge into a six to eight hour television show, like that's tremendously exciting to me. So, um, so that's what we're up to. We're turning it into a television event series, um, you know, with Sonar Entertainment as our TV studio and with access to Beatles music. So it's a tremendously exciting time. That is a beautiful story that hearing you, you tell this, the way that it's unfolded, it started off with your personal interest. You were looking for personal inspiration for you. And now you've turned this into something else. And now, I mean, you're really swinging for the fences with this thing to inspire yeah. other people. That's your goal. That's your goal yeah. to say, look, Brian did some great things. I love the I love the dream talk. And you're you're getting to pass this on probably yeah. globally. Yeah. Congratulations, Forget man. The fences. I'm I'm aiming for the moon, you know? <laughs> <laughs> love it. Love it. That's great. But Vic, thank you so much. I don't want to take up too much of your time. I but I, I do appreciate this conversation. Again, I don't know how it's gonna unfold in the edit uh, as I okay. tell this story. But uh, you know, if don't you're okay. Edit. If you're okay with it, I think there's some other things. I'd like to hang on to this footage. There might be some other things that as I tell other stories, you know, not just about the Beatles, but if I get specifically uh, into Brian's story a little bit, I'd love to grab some of that and throw it in there because you, you know your stuff, but it's not only your knowledge. I mean, your passion behind it is really cool. You know? yeah. Hey, as, as a quick aside, that, that might also be, uh, be useful for, for your clip. Um, you know, when Brian was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, um, you know, God, God bless them for realizing that Brian deserved to be in the Rock and Amen, Roll Hall of Fame. Yeah. Um, but they also, uh, God bless them also for knowing that they didn't know much about Brian. And so I got a phone call, uh, from the rock hall and they said, we are so pleased that we're inducting Brian, but we also know that we don't know much about this. And so can you help us, you know? And so I was able to consult, uh, the rock hall, um, on, on Brian's induction. And, uh, and you will notice that if you saw, if you were at the ceremony, um, you know, they would, the, even the, the interstitials, you know, they were saying coming up next, we're going to be inducting Brian Epstein. And, uh, and I, and when Peter Asher gave the speech, you know, he talked about Brian Epstein and, uh, and that was, I think in large part because, I had consulted on that and I was very proud that the Rock Hall got it right. And the other thing that I did for the Rock Hall was was and for Peter Asher in his in his speech was I contacted the the family. You know, and the family are very private and they decided that they didn't want to come to the ceremony, but they did did submit a, you know, a little brief little statement that Peter read in his uh in his induction speech. And um, you know, I, I hope that the family was proud that, that that they were represented in a in a few sentences in the speech and that the name was pronounced correctly. Great footnote. All right, man, I'll let you be, Vivek. Thank you so much. Lenore, You're thank right. you. All right. Said, uh, like, yeah. <laughs> she waved. I don't know if you could see her in the background. I but, saw her. Uh,
Um, you thank you so much. And uh, let me know if you need anything else. Great. Thanks a lot, Vivek. All right. Y'all take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.